They said it was biologically impossible for a human to see clearly underwater without goggles. You run out of oxygen, you become one of the dead guys lining the side of the route. They said no one could survive the death zone of Everest without oxygen tanks. But nature found a way. In the corners of the world that maps forgot, people are doing things that science cannot fully explain. They are the world's best free divers. They spend hours per day underwater. They can hold their breath longer than anyone else. They dive down into the seabed and forage and they hunt. They hunt underwater with spears. From the sea nomads growing bigger organs to the ostrich people of the desert, these aren't just cultural tricks. These are genetic mutations. And get this, some of these changes happened almost overnight. Are we looking at a new species of human? Human biology just changed forever. It starts with a heartbeat, or rather the lack of one. When you put your face in cold water, your body panics. It triggers the diving reflex. Your heart slows down. Blood leaves your hands and feet and rushes to your brain and heart to keep you alive. It is a survival mechanism. But for the Bajo people of Southeast Asia, this is not just survival, it is a lifestyle. They are known as the Sea Nomads. They live on boats, stilt houses, and coral reefs. They spend 60% of their workday underwater, and I am not talking about swimming, I am talking about hunting at depths of over 200 feet on a single breath. For years, people thought they were just really good at swimming. Just practice, right? But here is the catch. A researcher named Melissa Elardo had a wild theory. She thought maybe, just maybe, they had evolved. So she took an ultrasound machine to the tribe. What she found shocked the scientific world. The Bajo people have spleens that are 50% larger than the average human. Now you might be thinking, who cares about a spleen? But listen to this. The spleen acts like a scuba tank for your blood. When you dive, the spleen contracts and shoots a boost of oxygen-rich red blood cells into your body. A bigger spleen means more oxygen. It means staying underwater for minutes while hunting fish with a spear. This is not something you can learn at the gym. This is genetic. They found a specific gene called PDE10A that controls this growth. The crazy part is, even the Baju people who never dive, the ones who stay on the boats, have the massive spleen. It is baked into their DNA, but it gets weirder. Just north of them, there is another tribe called the Mokan. They faced a different problem. The ocean is blurry, the salt stings. Human eyes are designed for air, not water. But the Mokan children, they look underwater and see perfect shapes. Scientists led by Anna Gislin did an experiment. They compared European kids to Mokan kids underwater. The European kids saw blurs. The Mokan kids could identify tiny patterns on a card. Here is the deal. The Mokan children have learned to constrict their pupils to tiny pinpoints, less than two millimeters. This increases the depth of field. At the same time, they stretch the shape of their eye lens. It is physically uncomfortable for a normal human to do this. It should hurt, but for them, it is automatic. They turn their eyes into cameras. This brings up a terrifying question regarding the ocean. The Mokan call it the laboon, the wave that eats people. In 2004, the massive tsunami hit. The ocean pulled back, silent and deadly. Modern tourists stood on the beach taking photos. They didn't know, but the Mokan knew. They said the ocean felt wrong. The laboon was coming. They ran to high ground before the wave even crashed. Not a single Mokan life was lost in their village. So we have larger organs. We have shape-shifting eyes and we have a sixth sense for disaster. It makes you wonder if they are adapting to the water or if the water is changing them. What they found in the high mountains defies gravity itself. The people who breathe thin air. If you think the ocean is scary, try the death zone. High in the Himalayas, the air is so thin that a normal person begins to die slowly. The brain swells, the lungs fill with fluid. It is brutal. Yet the Sherpa and Tibetan people treat Mount Everest like a backyard hike. For decades, climbers assumed Sherpas were just tough, but it is not about toughness. It is about blood. In 2014, a study in the journal Nature dropped a bombshell. Tibetans carry a super athlete gene called EPAS1. Most of us have thick blood at high altitudes because our body panics and makes too many red blood cells. This causes clots and strokes, 
But the Tibetans, their blood stays thin. It flows fast. They get more oxygen with less effort. This gene didn't come from nowhere. Geneticists believe it came from an ancient, extinct species of human called the Denisovans. Basically, they are running on ancient hardware that the rest of us lost. But let's switch gears to the heat. Go to the Rift Valley in Kenya and Tanzania. Here you find the Maasai. These guys are famous for jumping. The Adumu jumping dance involves warriors springing straight up over two or three feet with their heels never touching the ground. They do this for hours. Their knees should be destroyed. Their ankles should be shattered. But the real mystery isn't the jumping. It is the food. The traditional Maasai diet is raw milk, meat, and cow blood. That is it. No kale, no quinoa, no avocado toast. They consume roughly 2,000 milligrams of cholesterol a day. That is double the recommended limit for a modern diet. By all medical logic, their arteries should be clogged with fat. They should be dropping dead from heart attacks at age 40. But here is the catch. They have some of the healthiest hearts on the planet. Researchers analyzed them and found no sign of heart disease. Zero. Their bodies have evolved to handle fats in a way that baffles nutritionists. They have a genetic adaptation in the FABP1 gene that burns fat differently. They are basically keto hacking their biology, but they have been doing it for centuries. And right next door, you have the Kalenjin people. You know how Kenya dominates every marathon in the Olympics? It is almost always the Kalenjin tribe. They are 10% of Kenya's population, but win 80% of the medals. Why? It is physics. They have extremely thin ankles and calves. It sounds like a small detail, right? But in running, every ounce on your leg matters. It is like removing weights from a pendulum. They use less energy to swing their legs. Plus, living at 7,000 feet above sea level means their lungs are supercharged. When they come down to sea level to race, they aren't just running, they are flying. It is unfair. It is biological dominance. And get this. Studies show that even untrained Kalenjin boys can outrun professional Western athletes. It is not just training. It is in the bone structure. It is in the blood. But physical feats are one thing. What happens when a tribe is cut off from the entire world for 60,000 years? One arrow shot at a helicopter changed everything we knew. The mystery of the Sentinels people. There is an island in the Indian Ocean that you cannot visit. It is illegal. It is dangerous and it is the home of the Sentinelists. They are the most isolated tribe on the planet. They have been there for maybe 60,000 years. They don't know what an iPhone is. They don't know who the president is, and quite frankly, they don't care. In 2004, after the tsunami, an Indian Coast Guard helicopter flew over the island to check if they were alive. A warrior ran out onto the beach. He didn't wave for help. He aimed his bow and fired an arrow straight at the metal bird. That message was clear. Leave us alone. But the real mystery is their immune system. If you or I walked onto that island, we would eliminate them. Not with a gun, but with a sneeze. They have no immunity to the common flu, measles, or the cold. A simple handshake could wipe out their entire civilization. On the flip side, they survive in a jungle filled with pathogens we can't handle. They are a biological time capsule. But because we can't get close, we have no idea how their genetics have drifted from the rest of us. They are a genetic black box. Now let's go from the ocean to the jungle sky. Deep in Papua, the Korowai people looked at the dangerous swamp floor filled with snakes, floods, and rival tribes and said, no thanks. So they moved up. They build houses in the tree canopy, sometimes 140 feet in the air. That is the height of a 10-story building. And they build these with nothing but hand tools and rattan rope. Imagine climbing a 10-story ladder every time you need to go home. No safety harness, just balance. Their foot structure has adapted to grip wet wood. Their balance centers in the inner ear are tuned to heights that would make a normal person dizzy and vomit. They say they build high to avoid evil spirits at night. But practically, it is the ultimate defense system. Up there, the air is cleaner. The mosquitoes are fewer. They literally rose above their problems. But the most extreme adaptation might be in Siberia. Meet the Saka people. They live in the coldest inhabited place on Earth, Yakutia. We are talking minus 90 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a temperature where your eyelashes freeze together and car tires shatter like glass. You would think humans can't live there. 
but the Saka thrive. Scientists looked at their DNA and found something called the UCP1 gene. It is related to brown fat. This is a special type of fat that doesn't just store energy, it burns it to create heat. It is a biological furnace. The Saka have a hyperactive metabolism that keeps them warm from the inside out. While you are shivering in a winter coat, their bodies are literally generating thermal energy like a boiler room. They drink kumis, fermented mare's milk, to fuel this fire. Their horses are just as tough. The Yakutian horse can stand in a blizzard for weeks and not freeze. Basically, the Saka have hacked the human body to function in a freezer. But adaptation isn't always about blood and ice. Sometimes it is about things we can't explain with a microscope. Sometimes it looks like magic. The women who paint their skin red see the world differently. Mysteries of the Zangbeto Spirits In the deserts of Namibia, water is more precious than gold. So, the Himba women don't bathe with water. Instead, they use smoke and stone. They are famous for their red skin. They crush a red stone called ochre and mix it with butterfat. They cover their hair and bodies in this paste called adjize. To the tourists, it looks cool, but biologically, it is genius. The paste acts as a perfect sunscreen against the scorching African sun. It repels insects that carry disease. It traps moisture so their skin stays hydrated in the dry desert. It is a cosmetic that doubles as a survival suit. But there is a rumor about the Himba that drove scientists crazy. People claimed the Himba could not see the color blue. They said because their language didn't have a specific word for blue, their eyes physically couldn't register it. Research proved this was a myth. They can see it just fine. But here is the catch. Because they have so many words for different shades of green, they can spot differences in vegetation that you and I would miss completely. Their language hacked their perception. They see a richer world because they have the words to describe it. Now let's talk about the Bragpa in the Himalayas. They claim to be the purest descendants of Alexander the Great's lost army. They look totally different from their neighbors. Green eyes, fair skin, tall. They wear massive headdresses made of fresh flowers, specifically orange blossoms. They say the flowers protect them from the evil eye. It sounds like folklore, but recently genetic studies smashed the Alexander theory. They are actually a unique mix of ancient Central Asian DNA that got isolated in the mountains. They are a living relic of a migration that happened thousands of years ago. The flowers? They are a symbol of a connection to the earth that modern society has lost. But nothing, and I mean nothing, is as wild as the Zangbeto in Benin. You might have seen the videos. Big, spinning haystacks made of raffia straw. They whirl around the village like tornadoes. They are the night watchmen, the spiritual police. The locals swear there is no human inside the costume. They say it is a spirit. To prove it, handlers will often flip the heavy costume over in the middle of a performance. And guess what? It is empty. Now, skeptics say it is a trick, a sleight of hand. But watching a heavy pile of straw spin with that much velocity, stop on a dime, and seemingly move on its own is unnerving. The Zangbeto patrol the streets at night. They catch thieves, they settle disputes, and recently they have started protecting the environment. They guard the mangroves from illegal fishing. Think about that. A spirit is doing a better job at conservation than most governments. Whether it is trickery or something else, the effect is real. The belief in the Zangbeto keeps the community safe. It creates a societal order that doesn't need police cars or handcuffs. It just needs a spinning pile of hay and a whole lot of faith. Is it possible we have a dormant gene waiting to wake up? Or are these abilities gone forever for modern humans? I want to know what you think. If you could pick one of these mutations, which one would you choose? Let me know in the comments. Hit that like button and subscribe for more wild discoveries.